I'm Tina Desiree Berg reporting for Status Coup. Today, we're going to talk more in depth about what's going on with the West Virginia State Democratic Party. This week, we broke news about the state chair making some racist remarks in regards to adding bodies to her executive committee without giving them votes. And here to discuss this with me further is Paula Jean Swearingen, who is an activist and an ex-senatorial candidate from West Virginia, and Kayleen Barker, who is also an activist in West Virginia, who has a master's in public uh, administration. Let's talk a little bit about the background. You folks both probably know the state chair. What's the story here, in your opinion? Um, you, uh, Kaylin, you want to lead off? Yeah, I mean, it's not really surprising that this happened. Um, there have been issues with Belinda Bia for, for as long as I can remember. Um, but this one, this particular issue, um, I think the reason that it's, I mean, aside from the fact that it was blatantly racist, I think the reason that this is catching so much attention from people in West Virginia is that this is one of the few times that their committee meetings were available for everyone to watch. And so many people were actually on that, you know, on YouTube, on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, watching it unfold live. So, you know, people that wouldn't normally be watching these committee meetings were sitting in front of their TVs watching this all unfold. So, um, you know, there was no hiding it, no way to backtrack out of it or hide what happened because so many people saw it happen. That's true. I saw some of that. They were muting uh, some of the microphones when people were trying to talk. Um, But specifically in the leaked audio that we got, you can hear the uh, state chair reassuring the rest of the executive committee that nothing is going to change because even though they added bodies, these folks don't have the right to vote. Do you think that sort of racist mentality is deeply ingrained in the Democratic Party? I think that that's definitely ingrained into the Democratic Party. I think it's indicative of a much larger problem, uh, even nationally, as to the idea that they want to, um, you know, give people just enough, um, you know, just enough clout to say we're part of your group but not actually let them be part of the group. Um, you know, they they don't want to hear they're not letting people, you know, people of color or LGBTQ plus people into their spaces. You know, they want to let them in so that they don't have to listen to people tell them that they're racist or, you know, homophobic. But they don't want to actually let them become a voting member of that group. They don't want to really let them in those executive spaces where decisions are being made. Craziness. So, Paula Jean, did you have any interactions with her when you were running for office? Well, I've had several interactions in 2018 and also in 2020. Um, the party was not very supportive, especially after we became the Democratic nominees, the federal Democratic nominees. We were all women. It was the first time in history that we had all progressives. Belinda B. Force showed up um, at one event. I'm a Democrat. We'll put signs out for you. A lot of the, the counties, um, they, they were very supportive of the candidates. But that's been a big issue. There's a lot of corruption here in West Virginia regarding the Democratic Party as well as Joe Manchin. It's well known that Joe Manchin pretty much owns the party. It's rumored that Belinda Biafor and him are cousins, but in spite of that, they are very close. They're good, close family friends. Um, The previous chair of the party was Larry Puccio, who was Joe Manchin's best friend. And so he has a lot of control and pull within the party. And if we look at this last last election and we start looking at red states, this really solidifies the failure of the Democratic Party, especially the West Virginia Democratic Party right now. People don't believe in the Democratic Party here in West Virginia anymore. The, The Democratic Party has been in control for decades. Joe Manchin, you know, he became our senator. He came in charge. It's not resonating in poor communities or not rich in minorities. When they were putting together these caucuses and it took them 47 years to be compliant with the DNC, they're not even including people in the coal fields. And that we, we live in one of the most poorest and sickest parts of the state. And there's no inclusion. When they had this meeting, too, they had one representative for the coal fields when it's supposed to be a man and a woman in the third district. So people just do not feel represented and we are not going 
to change anything here in West Virginia until the Democratic Party steps up, stops with the corruption, stops with the racism, and they start being inclusive instead of exclusive and actually listening to the people that are deeply impacted by, you know, the declining poll. People, you know, minorities, this state is 95% white. Minorities definitely need to be represented in this state. And people that are actually struggling, they just do not feel like they're represented by the party. So propaganda, the Republican Party appeases to people because they feel like that they just can't believe in Democrats anymore. And it's a huge, huge problem. So it is a huge problem. Uh, And we had a similar situation that developed in Alabama a few years ago where the state chair was not implementing a proper diversity plan. And she was challenged at the uh, DNC summer session meeting and she ended up losing her credentials uh, at that summer session, which means she became persona non grata to the DNC. So West Virginia has a similar situation going on where they have uh, activists in the state have filed a challenge to get her decredentialed from the DNC and there's a special meeting this week. Do you have any updates on that? Well, the um, grassroots reformers here in West Virginia, led by Selena Vickers, um, actually, um, you know, petitioned the DNC to have their credentials, um, you know, brought for the committee to, you know, determine whether or not they should keep them. Because it's not just, you know, it's not even just about this one incident of racism. It's about a continuing uh, pattern of failure among the leadership of the party. Um, you know, there's parliamentary issues that they do not follow the charters or bylaws of the DNC or their own state charter or bylaws. Um, there's issues with, you know, no one in, in seems to, including the parliamentarian, understand parliamentary procedure. Um, you know, there was a, parliament or, or a parliamentarian here in West Virginia uh, that actually did a report on the, that one meeting just mm-hmm. to see you know, how many, you know, issues there were as far as procedure goes. And he ended up with, in the first, you know, five minutes of that meeting with six pages worth of notes of just the fact that they're not following the procedures. So it's about, you know, racism, discrimination, procedure, a lack of strategy, a pattern of failure. I mean, it's, it's a culminating issue that just came to a head with this meeting that was broadcast live. And I think that that's a point that a lot of people are missing is that this isn't just one racist comment in one meeting. Right. This is, you know, a decade yeah. of issues that have just come to a head. They were tasked with setting up diversity plans in the late 70s. And now it's 2021. How is this still a thing? I mean, if the Democratic Party wants to be the party of inclusion, the party against racism, the party that represents uh, my, you know, minority groups and those that are disenfranchised, then they need to be that party. They need to come to the table and actually be that and stop pretending to be something else. They, uh, you know, can't go on for decades saying we're going to implement these diversity plans and then actually not do it. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah. So in regards to the Rules and Bylaws Committee, do we have an update on that and what's happening? Um, Basically, um, the meeting lasted for about two hours. Um, A lot of people felt like the questions that were being asked were scripted, um, that no one was really interested in hearing, you know, the nitty gritty reasons as to why they were being brought before them. Um, And... You know, a couple of times it seemed as though uh, they were bothered to even mess with it. Um, You know, it seemed like they didn't even want to be there. There were a couple, you know, I think there was one committee member that actually did seem interested. You know, there was a, you know, an issue with how the election of the chair and and the other members was held because there's rules about timeline and how you have to notify people. So the issue was that no one was notified that the elections were going to happen. And that was by design, according to what Selena was saying, yeah? Absolutely. Um, that, that's just another, you know, part of the story, you know, that when things like that happen, they don't let people know. They don't. And um, supposedly there was 30,000 emails sent out. Um, but Belinda, which anybody that works in comms knows that if you want to pull up 30,000 emails that you sent, it takes about five seconds to pull a report off of your 
your, you know, your Gmail account to show, hey, these are who I sent these to, these are how many, this is when, and this is what it said. Uh, but that can be produced. Um, and they just kind of brushed it off and moved on and, and nobody lost their credentials for the DNC. It was like, it really felt like a slap in the face to the people in West Virginia from the DNC. It felt like we're not important enough to mess with, right. you know, that it's just the little West Virginia, we're a red state anyway, who cares? Um, and that's not really the case. West Virginia is not a red state. I know that, you know, we have, but it's not because we are a red state. It's because the Democratic Party in, in West Virginia does not have a strategy on how to reach people. Right. And that's shown, you know, when Belinda BFOR took office as, you know, even the vice chair, there were 60% of this voters in West Virginia that were registered Democrats. Well, in the time of her tenure, it's down to 35. And people say, you know, that's because of Trump, but other states have figured out how to navigate the Trump issue and still maintain their base of voters. And our party was unable to do that. And that's because of the lack of leadership. Right. Well, I think it's very telling if you go back to the 2016 yeah, and the party continued to back Hillary Clinton. And I would imagine that a lot of West Virginians look at Hillary Clinton, look at the Clintons and that wing of the party and look and see banksters, see people that support the wealthy elitists that don't seem to give care about working class issues at all. So it seems toned up on, on part of the parties to, to be doing that when they could be back in a candidate that would have won those votes. And instead they're handing that off to the right winger that comes in and says, hey, I'm for the working class, regardless of whether that's true or not. Let's talk about Joe Manchin for a moment because uh, Belinda Biafor is close to Joe Manchin, they're friends, they're associates. And Joe Manchin has a new place in the sun right now because he's willing to play hardball. He's willing to play chicken with the progressives. Uh, he puts his foot down and says, I'm not going to vote on this unless I get my way. And the progressive response is to do nothing. They're not willing to also put their foot down and also play hardball in response. So he's been given a lot of uh, power and authority uh, via that, right? He's in control. He's willing to, to play hardball. The people that want to keep Joe Manchin in power is the Democratic establishment and people like Belinda Beaufort. And this is not just about Belinda Beaufort. It's about like five, six people within the party that are deeply connected to Joe Manchin. In 2016, when Bernie Sanders did win all of our counties in West Virginia, all of our super delegates voted against the will of people and voted against Bernie Sanders. They do not support candidates like they're supposed to. Joe Manchin can tease and say, oh, I'm going to after... The, you know, the 2018 campaign was within weeks. He said he was going full MAGA. The party is yeah. very diligent about not holding candidates and their incumbents accountable to, to the people of this state or even the Democratic Party platform. And Joe Manchin is well known for that. And we had our, our Democratic governor, for example, Jim Justice. He's one of the biggest polluting coal barons in West Virginia. He owes unpaid mine fines in Tennessee, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Virginia. He hasn't paid his taxes. Him and Joe Manchin are good friends. He was a Republican. Joe Manchin recruited him. He campaigned for him. The party campaigned for him. After he became governor, he switched back to Republican. <laughs> so it, it, it's just, if you even look at Shelley Moore Capito's donor and you look at Joe Manchin's donors, they are funded by the same people. And that's the pharmaceutical industry, the gas industry, and the coal industry. There's no hope for economic development. They're in the pockets of the pharmaceutical industry. We're dealing with one of the most, the biggest addiction crises in the country. We lead in drug overdose deaths in the country right now, and nothing's being done. And now, you know, the part, you know, the Democratic Party's like, oh, Jim Justice is so bad, but there's never been an apology to voters that voted for him, knowing how corrupt he was. They have lost total faith with the voter base here in this state. And even with candidates like myself, ordinary people that are struggling and trying and trying trying to change the dynamic. There's no support from the party and it's been demonized so bad that it doesn't matter. If you've got a Democrat, Dem the label Democrat by your name, people just automatically believe that you're corrupt and they're not gonna listen to what you have to say. After I announced in 2020 that I was running for office again, Belinda Biafor to the media, her response was, she got too big too fast. 
who better qualified to represent the people of West Virginia than the people that are living it every day and know what our struggles is like. There, there's no credentials that you have, you know, there's nothing that has to credential you to go to Congress. But you have to be wealthy and rich and live under their big tent that we're not allowed underneath. It, the people that know what it's like to struggle day to day should be representing us. And they do not get behind candidates like me. The biggest pushback I received in 2018 in the primary against Joe Manchin was the Democratic establishment. I was at the West Virginia Federation of Democratic Women's meeting. They didn't even say my name. They gave me three minutes to speak and said, would the U.S. Senate candidate come up? That's how they treat progressive candidates, candidates in this state and anybody that tries to challenge the establishment and all the corruption within the party. It's blatant discrimination. And people, I don't know why the national media is not covering this. This is blatant racism. And Joe Manchin is the leader of the party, and we hear nothing but crickets. Why are we not hearing from the DNC? Why are we not hearing from Joe Manchin? Why is CNN not covering this and talking about the blatant racism within the party, especially with what is going on with Joe Manchin and the filibuster? Not only do West Virginia, the people of West Virginia suffer, the people in this country suffer because they have propped Joe Manchin. They've stood behind him no matter how corrupt he is. And not only does West Virginia suffer, everybody suffers. And it's an embarrassment. We are always getting a black eye in West Virginia because of people like Belinda P. Ford and the people in power, the Democratic Party, that don't care if we live or die. There's people in this state that still don't have clean water and adequate sewage systems, and they don't care. No, clearly they don't. And, uh, and, and since she's going to keep her credentials, she's going to be, remain the state party chair. That It has a lot to do with the position that Joe Manchin is currently in. The DNC, you know, whether they progressive or moderate, whatever, it doesn't matter. There are policies in the Senate right now that would significantly help the people of West Virginia. The PRO Act, the infrastructure plan, the family rescue plan, all of these things are just sitting there because, for one, the filibuster has been made to the point where you can just say, "Eh, I don't like it. I'm not going to vote for it. I'm going to filibuster it instead. When it used to be that you had to stay. Stand in your tennis shoes for 16 hours and talk nonstop if you really believe that you did not, you know, if you didn't support a bill, you had to work to stop it. Now you can just say, I don't want to, you know, and Manchin's in a position to make or break plenty of big pieces of legislation that would help the people of West Virginia. And he is showing us that he does not care. He doesn't care about us. And it's just, you know, people that have been fighting against the corruption and things in West Virginia for years know that Manchin doesn't care about us. But he's really, really, really good at, I'll give credit where credit's due. He's a really good politicking politician. He's good at it. He knows how to go into these, you know, small events in his jeans and his ratty t-shirt and convince people that he is one of them, even though he comes from a political dynasty. He's really good at that. And, you know, that's something that, you know, I think the DNC realizes he's good at bringing in money because he's a moderate. He's really good at, you know, keeping the DNC and the Democrats in the news. Right. That's true. Because of his game that he's playing in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that they wanted this to tarnish that. I think that has more to do with it than people are willing to admit. And I don't think that's going to change until the progressives are willing to fight back and start playing hardball and doing... That means doing what Joe Manchin's doing, right? That means putting their foot down and standing up to him and not letting him take all the power in the way that he's doing currently. And they haven't seemed uh, to be willing to do that. Sorry, I keep getting like a lag. So I think oh. I've been speaking in the... <laughs> and sorry, then, no worries. Yeah. The internet. Uh, yeah, Appalachian internet especially. I hear you. So do you think that's going to change? Uh, probably not, though, right? I, it doesn't seem to be. I mean, I don't think so. You know, the the mansion game, you know, it, it's the game that the, the Democrats played when the Republicans are in control. You know, they gave over everything. You know, all, all the well, the GOP would say, we want this. And the, the Democrats were like, OK, have it. And then, you know, they expected them to vote for these bills and they never did. They never voted for them. Right. So, you know, and now we're we're seeing the same game happen between the mansion and, and then the moderates 
and the progressives and the progressives just are not fighting back and it's really disheartening to see them you know basically bend over and take it from mansion you know <laughs> and these people were designed to take whenever it. they had the opportunity to make change they're in a position to change things <laughs> and they're just letting him railroad them in the senate and no one's doing anything about it no, which means, leads me to believe it's by design. I mean, it's easy to let Joe Manchin become the scapegoat for everything the neoliberals want, uh, you know, let him take the heat, and then they get away with still pretending to be progressives when they're not really progressives and they're not really fighting for the working classes out there, right? Well, we are looking at, you know, everybody across the state running for, you know, as committee members again. Okay. And, you know, just interviews like this, get the word out because the national media is not trying to cover it. And I, I have to hammer it again. West Virginia adopted one of the most uh, progressive platforms in the country. And that we keep on, the, the party keeps on pushing candidates that don't even adhere to the party platform. And if you look, af even after that, then... You know, this last election, their state went sweeping red and we get we we as citizens and people that are fighting the corruption in in this state and across this country. I've been an activist for almost 20 years as a mother and grandmother, just fighting for clean water and clean air, begging these people to do something. And we are simply not heard when these people placate to people that do not stand behind the policies that'll actually change people's lives. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to get the word out and let people know that this is happening here. These people are blatantly racist and they're standing on the heels of Joe Manchin and he's holding this country hostage and these people are equally responsible. So, you know, people need to get on the horn with social media. They need to get on the horn with Manchin's office and Capito's office. But Shelly Moore Capito and Joe Manchin are good family friends. Don't think just because one's a Republican and one's a Democrat, they're any different. They zip line together. They have family dinners together. They are fine. Their grandchildren and children are fine. They have turned a blind eye to the children dying and starving in the state. And some people don't even have something so basic as a clean glass of water. And I, you know, just as a leader in this movement and being in the limelight, I, I'm embarrassed. We're all embarrassed as West Virginia citizens that all this keeps on going on. And I want to apologize for the poor Democratic leadership in this state. It's not us, y'all. And we need help. If we're going to buy, if fight this corruption, we can start with states like West Virginia. We can we can start, you know, the, be the activists that we're supposed to be and fight for our families. And we can save children in West Virginia and across the country because of this corruption. And it is corrupt here. And people need to be telling it everywhere that this is a sincere problem. It's racism and it's corruption to the core. Just like we have some elected incumbents that are executive committee members. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's yeah. it's it, it's immoral. It's it's a conflict of interest. And we have some of those people that don't even stand behind the Democratic Party platform and they're allowed to be committee members as well as being representatives. So it, it's it's just infiltration. It's and it's it's something that they've been doing for a long time. And it's gonna take an uprising and us fighting this corruption until it gets any better for any of us. Yeah, no, I hear you, Paula Jean. Um, any parting words? Uh, anything else you'd like to update us on? Um, well, uh, just please call Joe Manchin and Shelley Moore Capito. Call their offices. You know, call uh, the Democratic Party in West Virginia. Call out, you know, the, 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 the DNC, asking them why they are not taking this issue seriously. And if we want to get back, you know, if, if there's people out there blue, no matter who, well, if it's no matter who, then the, the who's need to stand up and get behind the party, too. And we, you know, we are in the fight for our lives. We have saw, suffered a lot of losses, but we have to continue to fight or children will continue to die. And that's point blank what's happening in this country. And it's a disgrace. And I'm here if anybody needs to reach out to me. But more importantly, let's just continue to lock arms in this movement and let's continue to fight for what's right.